what happened internally when you started speaking up about this? Because you started to ask questions, didn't you? I did. Um, I started asking questions often and it got to the point where I even was having conversations one-on-one with the doctor saying, I, we are harming children. We are doing this. Um, and what would they say? So it's interesting because I, I only recently read the Hannah Barnes book about the Tavistock and I was, it was almost the exact same response, which I was told my tone was wrong that I was, I shouldn't be directly challenging doctors in team meetings, that I was out of my lane, that I was, um, it was almost identical what happened at Tavistock. Um, and the way that I was kind of treated was I was the annoying squeaky wheel. Oh, we know Jamie's going to have another issue. And it got to the point in the center where there was a an actual directive that we were no longer allowed to use the phrase, I have concerns about a patient. And in medicine, that should scare anyone because, because if your surgeon comes in and the nurse thinks that they're drunk, sure as hell that nurse should be able to say, I have concerns about this patient right now and we need to stop. We need medicine needs people who are empowered by their medical institution to speak up. Nurses, social workers, case managers. You think someone was given the wrong dose. You think they're going to cut off the wrong limb. Like you have to have all of these layers in medicine have to have people who are empowered and encouraged to stand up. And instead it was routinely be quiet, stop. You're wrong. Be quiet, stop. And it got to the point finally where we were told, get on board or get out. And that was that was the final. You say we. Were there other people at the center who agreed with you? We didn't always agree for the same reasons, but there were a few other people who who agreed. Okay. And, and all you mentioned, the same concerns. Sorry. Yeah. And you mentioned speaking directly one-on-one with doctors. So if you come to a doctor in that sort of clinic and you would say, I think we're harming the, these children, what, did, other than shut up and, and stop raising it, did they, did they have any counter arguments or any explanation for why, what they were doing, what they were doing? Um, sometimes it would be, well, what do you want me to do instead? Come up with a different solution then. And I think... Part of that is that the whole model of care is so upside down right now that it's like every that they're that the doctors are even just a cog in the spinning machine. And they're like, the only way I know how to spin is this way. Like, you're telling me we're hurting people, but I, they would be like, what, how do I do differently? Because then it would have to stop the, it was almost like for them to actually stop and think would have to stop the whole mechanism. The whole machine would have to stop because it's not just their portion. It's the therapist portion. It's the parents Mm -hmm. portion. It's the kids themselves. It's the hospital. It's like all this whole machine is spinning and, and they were like, what, what do I do? And I guess in some ways I just got to the point where I was like, you know, this whole machine just has to stop right now because the way that it's going is just, it's not, it sort of sounds, what you're describing is like a little bit like a conveyor belt where oh, like, it, yeah. right. And then you're going up to one person at one point and you're going, well, don't put this bit in. And they're going, well, there's a whole machine here. There's a whole conveyor belt. You know, this is my job. I give hormones or I do this mm-hmm. or I do that. Right. Yes, exactly. And this is what they call the affirmative model where essentially yes. the moment a kid says I'm dysphoric from that point on, they're just on the conveyor belt and there's no getting off. Unless as they long themselves as the have kid, a change of heart. Right. As long yeah. as the kid is saying, I want that as the end, then that's what the kid's going to get. And you said upside down, and that really is upside down because as we talked about earlier, a child cannot really consent, but they are driving this whole thing is what you're telling us. Oh, the, the language even in some of the activist groups is that you're supposed to be child led, that the child's supposed to be leading this. And here's the thing about kids. Kids are 
who think that they're the ones who are supposed to make the decision are actually in more distress and are in more pain because Mm -hmm. they feel like there's no grown-ups in the room Mm -hmm. who are in charge. And as a parent, I know for my own kids, they do better in life when I can say things to them like, hey, this is not your decision. We're the grown-ups. We've got this handled. We know what we're doing. You can go be a kid. Do not worry about these things. And as they get older, you maybe add a little bit more like, no, at Disneyland, you cannot buy the whole toy store because grown-ups only have this much money. And you slowly start giving them some senses of choice. But no, a 14-year-old does not want to think that they have to make the decision for what the whole rest of their life is for their fertility and for their medical care. 